going on? I'm Claudia Tarico, editor of Demand Gen Report, and we're back for another episode of CXO Conversations. With me today is Leela Srinivasan, CMO of SurveyMonkey, and I'm so excited to chat with her because it's been it's been a little bit of a while. I think last time we spoke was like last year. Leela, it's so great to see you. Thank you so much for taking the time. Great to see you too, Claudia. And oh my word, I, I'm trying to think about the journey we've both been on since we last spoke and it feels like a lifetime, doesn't it? Yeah, it really does. Uh, so for context, everyone, um, I actually had a lovely conversation um, in front of a, a fairly small crowd, but it was a really nice uh, all-female event during Dreamforce last year in San Francisco. And yeah, so this time is is definitely a little different than uh, what we experienced in 2019. But to be honest with you, I feel as though feedback and getting feedback from customers and employees, you know, leveraging surveys and really getting that first party data, in my opinion, has really always been a critical component of go to market strategies. Um, That first party insight is so valuable these, especially now as well. Um, But uh, it's kind of a no brainer to to really use surveys and and really get to know buyers and and your customers. So Leela, tell me, how has the need for feedback like this really accelerated during this time? Yeah, so before all of everything happened, (laughs) I I already was thinking about this decade even as, uh, you know, this feedback economy, there was just this outpouring of feedback, we saw, you know, the rise of digital, people wanting to be heard, this desire to, to leave reviews and share. And I think we're going to look at 2020, look back on it as another kind of resurgence almost into this golden age of feedback. And, you know, I know the joke's wearing a little thin right now, but we've seen so many plot twists this year, plot twist upon plot twist as leaders, whether you're in marketing or, or elsewhere. And frankly, there's been no manual for how you navigate that as a leader. And so when you don't have a game plan, when you're facing all of this uncertainty, one of the first things that you should be doing is leaning into feedback and really understanding whether it's your customers, your employees, your patients, your students. We're seeing just this real surge in organizations' desire and very real need to understand these core stakeholders. So I think it's relevant for marketers. I think it's relevant for, for leaders at large, but there's just, you know, it's, it's basically that, you know, the, the way we're living right now, we have to get that feedback. Yeah, absolutely. So I want to talk about using leveraging feedback, but for just different stages of the buyer and or customer journey. Mm-hmm. What can B two B organizations learn from from these types of insights as they as they relate to basically each of these stages? Yeah, sure. So but just to tee up that conversation, um, as you can imagine, we've been running research all year to just make sense of, of what's going on in the world. And uh, one of the pieces, pieces of research that we ran said that 43% um, are saying that their companies have accelerated digital transformation this year, which is entirely to be expected given that other options are just frankly not there for businesses. And 68% of uh, CX professionals that we surveyed said that they have added customer touch points to their journey. So organizations everywhere are just having to rethink what is that customer experience and how are we delivering it? So I think that's the first thing is just, you know, this huge uh, shift that organizations have had to scramble to make to serve their customers. And then as we think about the buyer journey or, you know, customer journey and how customers encounter you all the way through, I think, um, you know, it's always been important to gather feedback, but especially in these times of change where your customer's environment is changing, but also the way you're serving them and, and interacting with them is changing, it becomes even more important. So we see organizations and SurveyMonkey included on this, thinking all the way through the life cycle, like where are the places to gather feedback from current customers, from future customers, from former customers. So upper funnel, really understanding the health of your brand relative to your competitor set. And, uh, you know, so that's one piece of it. Um, Also, we've seen this rise of uh, marketeers and others in in the brand uh, and campaigns world, really trying to zero in on uh, customer and and, uh, future customer feedback when it comes to campaigns that are coming out. Because, again, when the world is shifting so much, we all went through that phase in March where we were uh, delicately tiptoeing around the right language to use. Should we say unprecedented? Should we say challenging times? You know, what was the language? And that was the backdrop for companies looking at their campaigns and saying, wait a second, I need to make sure 
that the messages that I'm putting out there to my future customers are going to resonate, that they won't fall flat, or even worse, they won't offend the people I'm reaching out to. So we see a lot of that top of funnel trying to gather feedback to make sure that you put your best foot forward and you understand your future customers. And then as you're, as people are coming to your website, that's another, you know, again, with this digital transformation, many more businesses seeing this surge in web activity. Um, you need to understand how your customers are navigating your site, whether they're finding the things that they need, uh, what that experience is like, as, even as they're trying to check out, right? If a customer is abandoning a shopping cart, why? Is there something technologically that went wrong? Did they not find what they needed? Like these are the types of questions that we see uh, savvy organizations really trying to understand so they can keep improving that, that digital experience. And then once you've got a customer on board, of course, there's just, you know, this is, as, as is often the case in uh, challenging economic times, you see organizations really thinking long and hard about retention and how can we, you know, hold on to the customers we have rather than having to go out and refresh our, our customer base. So just making sure you retain that dialogue with your customers throughout their journey with you, checking in to understand their challenges, checking in to understand how you're adding value, uh, net promoter score, those types of measure to really understand their loyalty to you and um, making sure you act on the data that you get back so that you can continue again, just keeping an eye on that customer experience and continually improving it. So net net is all the way through that journey from pre-customer all the way through happy post, uh, post uh, acquisition customer, hopefully into evangelism, lots of opportunity to ask for feedback. Awesome. So, I mean, Given that there are so many opportunities to, to, to take, get this feedback, what are like, what are some do's and don'ts that you'd recommend? Um, even what type of questions should people be asking? Um, let's, let's start with buyers and customers at this point, sure. just to like, you know, you don't want to overdo it and you don't want to annoy anybody and like constantly be asking. So what are some do's and don'ts? What channels kind of resonate most? What are you seeing there? Yeah. I think the uh, these are all good call outs, uh, Claudia. I mean, there is uh, there are many more opportunities to ask for feedback, but you do have to be thoughtful about what you're asking and then also where you're asking. So in terms of the questions, uh, it, it, it's a little bit based on the, the circumstance. So I think there's a, a standard kind of short and sweet set of questions that you ask after support interactions, for example. And it's really important to only get that information after a support interaction, but be able to flag um, any negative responses and follow up quickly with a customer if they've had a less than stellar experience, right? So there, there are, you know, there are these standard places in the journey where I think you are, I think a lot of organizations understand they need to check in and just understand how that particular transaction or that particular activity went for customers. Aside from that, uh, we see best in class organizations running regular uh, relational NPS uh, surveys and studies to just understand the overall health and loyalty of their customer bases. Um, when it comes to questions outside of those uh, sort of standard uh, ways of operating, you know, it's funny, I, I wrote a post on this, I want to say it was about 18 months ago on LinkedIn, just like, what are the questions you should be asking your customers? And I know that feels like a lifetime away, but uh, the, the 18 months, but some of the, you know, just the classic questions or the, the types of issues you should be di uh, zeroing in on, um, I think hold true. So Fundamentally, in this era, you should be trying to figure out what can your company do to better serve your customers' needs. Um, so that's one thing, especially when those needs have been changing. And the reason they bought your technology or your business or your service may no longer be important to them. They may have far greater uh, priorities that have suddenly come up in this, this uh, weird times that we're facing. So understanding how you can better serve your customers' needs, understanding their biggest challenges. I think the route to great marketing and great customer experience is is based on understanding your customers' challenges, pain points, and what they're trying to accomplish and trying to find the uh, zero in on that sweet spot where you can deliver the value to help them overcome that challenge or accomplish that goal. And then really having um, a strong sense of the value that you provide to your customers. So asking questions around how can I better serve your needs? What are your biggest challenges? And trying to get good answers on the value that you provide, really important for understanding the health of that customer base and continuing to innovate and think through ways that you can continue delivering a ton of value to them. 
Yeah. And I imagine that this type of feedback, like, yeah, you're getting, you're getting it to, you know, better serve the customer, but it's also fueling a whole, an entire content strategy. Right. I mean, I imagine any type of feedback or just responses that you get from whether it's a survey or just, you know, one-on-one, it literally could fuel an entire content campaign, or it could do it. You know, you could write a blog post, an ebook and things like that. Are, do you see that often? Oh my goodness. Yes. So we were, as you can imagine, we do drink our own champagne or eat in our own restaurant, as I prefer to say. Um, (laughs) We were always uh, uh, heavy users of our own uh, technology to run market research, basically to, to basically use in content campaigns. I think that's one of the most powerful uses of, uh, of survey technology this year. It's taken on a whole new level of urgency. If you look at uh, sort of the March to September timeframe in particular, we were running weekly coronavirus research in the US, in Canada, in the UK to really understand how how consumers were uh, adapting their behaviors, how they were feeling, how they were thinking, what they were or weren't doing, um, what they were worried about. And that was all information that we shared freely as as a resource for the world at large. Um, but also channeled into specific audiences that we work with uh, who are just trying to make sense of the economy and how things were trending and where they might expect to see things pick up versus versus drop off. So so that was one example. Um, as we saw the rise in the conversation around race and racial equity, uh, you know, starting off in sort of late May into June, uh, that was another area where we chose to go deep and really, uh, I think, try and inform the conversation with research of uh, the population, basically, to understand how people were reacting, uh, you know, what were their, what was their take on some of the some of the events that were going on, and just trying to bring that back into the whole conversation around diversity, equity, and inclusion, which is something that we believe very strongly in at SurveyMonkey. And so, uh, again, just trying to provide value back into the world in the form of of content uh, around some of the the most pressing issues. And then on the business side, as we've continued to go through the year, uh, you know, I'll highlight one piece that the team recently put out, which was on uh, what we're expecting to see in holiday shopping habits, uh, because this is a, you know, in the, in the heels of everything that we've seen this year, who knows, you know, who knows what to expect? How are consumers really thinking about shopping? Uh, what, what do we think they will or won't do? How open are they to new ideas? How many of them are, are planning to do all their shopping online, et cetera, et cetera. So a whole slew of insights that we're able to provide back out to the business community uh, to help them uh, make decisions. And by the way, the, the uh, not, so, not so big secret is any company can run that sort of research to inform their strategy in addition to the content that they're putting back, putting back out into the world. So I think it's an incredibly valuable uh, use of, uh, of survey technology. That's great. And kind of moving the conversation a little over to feedback from employees. You mentioned that's obviously a huge component of it. And especially during this time where we're all obviously not in the office together. um, What types of questions should either leaders or just overall companies be asking their employees, especially this year? Yeah, it has been so important to stay in tune with your employee base. And uh, one of the things that we did earlier in the in the crisis was actually put up a page of resources, so te- survey templates that you can you can basically run yourself or adapt for your your company. So if you go to surveymonkey.com/coronavirus, you'll mm-hmm. still see those templates up there, and there are a number of different options to to check in with employees. But if I think back over the course of the last nine or ten months and some of the ways that we've been doing that, so when everything happened and we sent everybody overnight to work from home. We were not necessarily a a work from home culture in the past. And when you flip that switch overnight, it's super important to understand how employees are feeling in general. What is making them anxious? Is it, you know, do they have health concerns? Are they responsible for other humans in their life that is is causing them to have uh, concerns or just competing priorities? Do they have school aged children at home that suddenly are in a, you know, having to learn in a whole different way? Um, How are they coping with social isolation? Uh, You know, what are the, again, what just, what are the things on their mind and how can, how can organizations basically do their best to help employees adjust to, to uh, just a very different way of working? So that was sort of the first, I'd say the first couple of months we were running uh, surveys probably every other week to take pulses on how people were feeling. And, you know, one of the takeaways from this year is you can't just do that once and then, and then you're done because the environment's been evolving 
in just crazy ways that we couldn't have pre predicted. And so we've you know, continued to have check-in type surveys over time so that you just understand how employees' uh, attitudes toward the pandemic or concerns about uh, social isolation are changing as, they, as we get deeper into the crisis. So that was kind of all of that. Then, of course, as, as we all come cl become closer to uh, hopefully going back to work at some point, we've already uh, said for the record that we are going to be uh, not, uh, not back in the office in a big way until uh, July of next year. So we made that decision relatively early. Nonetheless, one of the things that fueled that decision was understanding what employees needed or what, what would make them comfortable to be back in an office environment. And when we saw the results of that survey and realized that uh, two or three of the big things that would make them comfortable, like the wide scale presence of a vaccine or availability of a vaccine, were things that were out with our control, that actually fueled our decision to say, you know what, we're going to make this easy and clean and we're going to wait until we feel, you know, post flu season, post everything else, it is safe to be back in the office and we can, we think we're closer to being able to provide some of the things that employees really need. So, you know, I think we've continued to to use, uh, use surveys and, and gather that feedback for navigating this crisis specifically. One other thing I'll highlight is, and I don't think enough companies do this, but this year of all years, given the hardships people are facing and just the very different, different environment, uh, I think it's really important for companies to be thinking about which benefits they're investing in for their employees. And one of my aha moments on joining SurveyMonkey was that we have historically eaten in our own restaurant as we do, asked employees for feedback on our benefits packages and uh, sought to understand what else might be interesting to them or valuable to them. And so we ran another benefit survey um, this year in advance of rolling out and deciding uh, the benefits that we want to offer so that we can again align our offerings to uh, where our employees feel like they, they need us most. So net net is think about your employees as your internal customers because that's what they are, right? You have to understand their needs their pain points, their challenges, and how you can make their lives easier and more comfortable. And we've used feedback throughout the year to, to do exactly that. Absolutely. I love that. Um, let's see, what else do I have for you? I mean, just in general, I'd love to just hear any advice that you would give, you know, other companies who are, maybe they're just starting to, or they're looking to incorporate more feedback into their, you know, go-to-market strategies and even planning. I mean, it's, it's already like beginning of the year. So planning for the year ahead, what advice would you give to organizations just starting out and, and really getting into the groove of leveraging feedback and, and getting that type of uh, it first party insight to fuel their strategies? Yeah. So first of all, congratulations on taking the plunge. It is never too early uh, <laughs> to start incorporating feedback and don't feel embarrassed or sheepish about the fact that this is maybe a relatively new muscle for your company. It is an incredibly important muscle for your company to be exercising. And that's the main thing is to focus on that. I think it, it, it's a little daunting because you can boil the ocean and ask everybody everything. So I would encourage uh, companies to just be really thoughtful about who they're asking for feedback from. Uh, you know, an example of this would be, um, so, you know, a couple of times in my career, at least, uh, we have uh, rethought messaging and positioning as we've gone into a new phase of our of our of our um, evolution a, a, as a company. This is outside of outside of SurveyMonkey. We've done it here as well. And the point being, when you when you gear up to uh, sort of reset the sort of reset your messaging and positioning, um, you need to make sure that you you are getting feedback from the audiences that you care about. Uh, so. I'll take you back to, oh gosh, many years ago at LinkedIn, this was an exercise that we ran where we were looking to really nail the messaging and positioning for the talent solutions business for the next three or four years, basically. And so it started with internal brainstorming and getting the ideas and the hypothesis on the table. We then took those ideas to one-on-one uh, -on -one conversations with a carefully selected mix of customers, prospects, thought leaders in the space to try and narrow the list uh, and then we did a quant survey to validate it with a broader audience. And it was really important that we could segment that audience by types of customer so that we could shine a light on whether our ideal customer profile really resonated with what we were saying. So I think the act of surveying is super important in gathering that feedback, but really understand who you're gathering feedback from. Because if you don't have a sense of that audience and whether it's the right audience for you, you can be steered in, exact, in entirely the wrong direction if you, if you don't uh, make sure that you have that lined up. 
So that's that's uh, that's one thing I would say. And then the second thing in when you're surveying customers and if customer feedback is the area that you're you're really starting to to get more involved in, I would uh, be inclined to not bite off more than you can chew. So choose uh, one or two uh, areas to get started and make sure that you have dialogue around the results and the implications of that. It's super important to understand the so what of the, the information that's coming back to make sure that that information is given visibility at the highest levels of the company. Uh, because that's, I think, how you become a more customer-centric, customer-forward organization that is really leaning into feedback and taking action based on what you hear. So we talk about listen, understand, and act, um, or listen, analyze, and act, and really just having the ability to pause, take stock of the feedback, and choose the one or two things, not the 27 things, because we all know what happens when you choose 27 things. Choose the one or two areas where you uh, see the opportunity to have impact by by taking that feedback and doing things differently. So just make sure you pick your battles and don't uh, try to solve all problems at once because this is a, a lifelong quest, my friends. <laughs> I love it. Um, I know SurveyMonkey recently, I think it was a, a few weeks ago, you guys launched a tech partner program, right? Can you tell me a little bit about That's it? Right. Like how, you know, what it, what it is, how it benefits, you know, organizations and, and really the inspiration behind it? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, partnerships uh, and technical integrations are hugely important to SurveyMonkey, to our strategy and also to our customers, because it's not just that feedback, as I talked about, it's how you put that feedback into action, how you, uh, you know, make sure it's flowing into the systems that you use so that you can do things differently for your customers and your employees and so forth. So we have 100 plus different uh, tech integrations out there with technologies ranging from, you know, Tableau and Microsoft Power BI to, uh, you know, the Marketos and Eloquas and HubSpots of this world to, uh, you know, just all sorts of different different ways that you can integrate our technology so you can drive toward action. What we decided over the summer was to launch uh, this, this uh, what we call our STEP program, this technology ecosystem program, because there's a set of partners um, that were, I think, even more um, eager to partner and collaborate with us and do some co-marketing and lean into our joint customer bases. So that list of, uh, of partners includes Zendesk, Gainsight, Freshworks, and others. And uh, the point of the, the campaign and the, the, the program is really to highlight the magic that happens when you uh, take that really important feedback that you're gathering with SurveyMonkey and you push it into these systems that are customer facing or that your front lines are using. So that's been um, been really, I think, a, a win-win, a uh, win for us, a win for our partners, a win for our customers as well, really, in discovering just how they can leverage uh, feedback in the different systems that they're using. Awesome. So let's steer the conversation a little over to you. Um, I'd love to hear, you know, you know, your CMO of SurveyMonkey. I'm, I'm, I imagine you manage a, a large team or fairly large. How have you and your team tackled this new reality since, you know, from March till now? Have, you know, any key learnings that you could share? Any hits or misses that you've experienced? Sure. So it's been a hell of a year. And if any of my team is listening, I first of all, just want to say thank you. Uh, because I know it's been tough. It's been tough for marketers everywhere. That's that's my honest assessment of the situation. And I think that's because if you reflect on how much uncertainty and how much flexibility has been the just the the thing that's needed from from our businesses, right? We entered the year with grand plans. We had this proactive strategy in place, and then in March, a lot of the specifics of that plan went straight out the window because channels were closed down or certain uh, messages that we had thought would be the way we wanted to proceed just weren't relevant and weren't going to resonate in this environment. So I am really so proud of the team for their ability to roll with the punches and display that resiliency um, that has been, I think, the hallmark of marketing teams everywhere in 2020. And what is exciting and gratifying is I've seen the team do some of their best work um, by focusing on where we can add value for customers. So really going back to basics, this has been the year of helping and not selling, in my opinion, really focusing in on, okay, where do our customers need us now? How can we add value in that moment? How can we just be the best possible partners for them so that they continue um, to work with us through, through thick and thin? So that's been, that's been um, super important. And, you know, that's even in a world where the, the higher level strategy of our business hasn't changed, right? We are 
we are now a three, uh, what we call three pillar organization where we have three product areas that we're known for. One is our, our classic surveys business um, from individuals all the way through into large enterprise leveraging uh, survey technology to, to get feedback from the constituents that they care about the most. The second uh, uh, pillar or area is our customer experience business, uh, where again, we've seen with digital transformation, especially the importance of making sure you understand feedback across all of the channels where you're encountering your customers. So taking that multi-channel approach and being able to pull the data together and also just be agile in doing that uh, and be able to move quickly. Third business being market research. And we've just seen, again, this avalanche of need for businesses to really understand the market and how it's shifting and how they can play into those, those uh, dynamics. So the overall strategy remained the same to pursue these three, three pillars, but the how of how we've done it has been, has been enormously different as you, as you can imagine. So I think what has been really important for the team is trying to help them prioritize as much as possible I think that's true in good years as well as bad, but if we've learned anything this year, it's the power of focus and the power of having a spreadsheet where the ideas live and knowing consciously what is below the line. Because even if it's a great idea, you just don't have the capacity to do it while you're doing all the other things. So I've been trying as much as possible to help um, my leaders really embrace that power of focus and prioritization to make sure that we try not to sign up for too many things, to make sure we leave some slack capacity because if anything can happen, it will happen. And we've seen that time and again this year. And um, my message for uh, anyone listening who is outside of marketing, perhaps in other leadership positions is this year we've really seen that it's time to start treating marketing as a scarce resource. We are not just you know there to catch all the things that becomes really draining and exhausting. We do our best work when you think about marketing as a scarce resource, the same way that you think about engineering and other constrained areas of your business. I love that. And honestly, I can't agree more. I mean, I'm sure, you, you know, your team is probably, you know, phenomenal, but just overall marketers, just from the work I've been doing over the summer and ever since, you know, March, the amount of creativity and innovation and agility from B2B marketers and, and even B2C marketers has just been really, truly outstanding. So it, it's really, it's really nice to see, you know, all of this new stuff come out from something that has been so awful. Uh, so that's definitely to me. A, a silver lining of the whole thing for sure. Talk to us about your role as CMO of SurveyMonkey. How long have you been there? And, you know, what have been your top priorities and key learnings so far? You know, even, you know, let's say before the pandemic or before 2020 even. Let me try and cast my mind back for you, Claudia. So uh, I've been at SurveyMonkey for about two and a half years now. And I came in as the first CMO. The organization had obviously had very talented marketers at the company before, but those marketers had been split into different teams and were reporting into different places. And so I had the, the privilege of coming in and creating one marketing team uh, when I joined back in uh, April of 2018. Uh, it's been an incredible journey so far. Uh, the first six months were pretty much dominated by our, our preparation for an IPO. Uh, so that was September 2018. And really since then, I think what we've been doing is continuing to build that story externally of feedback as a mission critical endeavor, as something every organization needs to be leaning into. And also along with that, uh, doing more and more to try and shift the perception of where SurveyMonkey plays in that space. Our roots are in a sort of consumer grade, uh, easy to use uh, technology that you buy online. Anybody can fire up SurveyMonkey and get going in minutes. It's incredibly powerful um, underneath the hood. So that's all good. But where there was a gap in understanding was just the fact that, as I mentioned earlier, SurveyMonkey is being used in some of the largest companies globally in uh, very large enterprise deployments because feedback has become central to the way those organizations operate. And so uh, I think a big part of this, the journey so far and the journey that we're looking toward as we continue ahead is to keep telling those stories, to keep elevating customers who are doing amazing things with our platform and uh, frankly, I always feel that marketing shines the most when we actually put our customers in the spotlight and have them share their experiences and tell their stories of transformation, which are powered by SurveyMonkey. So we've still got a lot of work to do, but uh, I, I remain more convinced than ever that uh, these three areas where we add value in surveys in general, in customer experience and in market research, these are all very fast growing, 
uh, businesses and areas where feedback's never been more needed. So we're, we're excited to, to keep forging ahead. That's awesome. And what about, you know, in terms of conversations that you're having with other leaders, you know, whether it's in the space or even outside of the industry, um, what have you, you know, learned from them? I, I usually like to ask this question because, you know, it's CXO conversations. So what other conversations um, or, you know, questions, you know, that arise are you having with, with other CMOs and, and how are stress levels and priorities kind of changing? Yeah. To go back to something you said earlier, Claudia, I think this is a silver lining, actually, of the pandemic is I have been uh, part of more CMO huddles and more peer conversations than ever before in 2020. And I think that's because we're all facing new challenges for the first time. And there's been a lot of comfort and value in checking in with one another to understand whether the things that we're experiencing are normal and on a par with other organizations, whether we're missing opportunities, what's working for peers, uh, where are some of the, the areas that they're struggling. So there's been a lot of experience sharing this year, more, I would say, than, than in, in typical years. And um, I think uh, I, I'm, I feel fortunate to have this network of peers that I can turn to for all manner of things. So recently, uh, you know, we've been having more conversations around team structures and I've been gathering experiences from my peers across organizations just to better understand some of the different options for structuring teams as we continue to evolve. Uh, we've talked through what tactics are and aren't working on the demand gen side, how soon we think live events are coming back, how organizations are budgeting for next year. I mean, there are all sorts of different ways where we can compare compare notes. So it's, again, it's just been, it's been really, uh, um, I think, helpful for uh, the CMO network to come together formally, informally, and uh, just use one another as a signing board. Yeah, I love that. And it, it's nice too, because now all these people that are usually, you know, traveling everywhere and going to meetings and events and stuff like that, they're home. So they have more, you know, you all have right. you know, more time to, to kind of connect and, and learn from each other. Um, I've definitely seen a lot of that and it's been great. So we're, we're coming down to the wire. Um, so I'd love to just ask, you know, what's next for you? What's next for SurveyMonkey? What are your priorities for, for the new year? And what else do you have to add? Well, uh, I think this ties back to my earlier comment around, you know, what is, what is SurveyMonkey's relevance and, and uh, importance at this moment in time? And, uh, you know, you're going to continue to see us talk about and share stories of these incredibly powerful use cases that our customers are leveraging our technology for. And this is all part of our evolution from horizontal service platform to uh, really a platform that is delivering a ton of value. And, you know, I'll, I'll, give, I'll give an example or two. Uh, who would have thought prior to 2020 that one of our marquee customers would be the Department of Health in Rhode Island, who've been leveraging SurveyMonkey in conjunction with Salesforce to basically run uh, opt-in surveys, sending out thousands of surveys via SMS every week to Rhode Islanders to better understand uh, how they are faring, uh, who's been exposed to coronavirus, who's sheltering in place, who needs help getting basic uh, needs taken care of, like food and so forth. And so, uh, you know, it's been, you think about surveys as sort of a frivolous, you know, oh, let's go get some feedback. This, this type of information or feedback that's flowing in through SurveyMonkey and into Salesforce is literally changing people's lives and helping government bodies to stay on top of uh, the pandemic and the things that they've been facing. We've seen the American Red Cross using SurveyMonkey Enterprise to gather offline feedback after COVID donations are, 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 are submitted. We've seen countless organizations leaning into feedback from their customers, from their employees to serve those populations better. Um, and you know, as, as organizations start coming back to work, now we're helping organizations track uh, uh, health symptoms and monitor those on site. Um, we, we've just seen all sorts of different um, use cases uh, spring up because of, of the pandemic. As we continue rolling into 2021 and fingers crossed, life at some point returns to comparative normal, I think people are gonna be thinking about feedback in a whole new light. They've seen the power of it. They've seen the importance of it. Uh, they've seen on the HR side just how important it is to be gathering feedback from your, from your employees. So we'll continue to be building out uh, better and more specific functionality to help HR teams, for example, um, to really uh, listen to their employees and gather that feedback and take action on what they hear. We'll continue to see digital transformation 
being the thing because once you once you go digital you don't go back it's not like you regress so continuing to help organizations really uh, make sure that they understand the digital and um, uh, overall experience of their customers through our technology so I just think we're in this incredible world of feedback the power of market research we've got so many opportunities I think to add value and to help customers to leverage the power of feedback so just super excited to keep telling those stories and uh, keep keep uh, helping everybody be better basically as a result. I love that. And honestly, you know, no company or organization is too big or too small to leverage, you know, surveys and get that feedback. And to be honest with you, I mean, on the demand gen report side, we, we conduct a variety of, you know, benchmark research throughout the year and we use SurveyMonkey. So if I'm able to build a survey in SurveyMonkey, Everybody can um, with a little help from from my teammates, but I think I'm slowly getting, you know, getting it down. Uh, so, yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Leela. This has been a really great conversation. Um, I mean, I already, you know, knew the value of feedback, but I, I, I hopefully this conversation really kind of proved it even more so to to everyone else who had any doubts. Um, so I really appreciate your time. It was so great to see you. Um, thank you so much. And thank you to everybody watching. Um, I hope you enjoyed this conversation and we'll see you again soon.